Well, I am so happy to be joined today by former Lightning forward Brian Boyle as we look back specifically at the 2016 Lightning Islander series, and he was a big part of that. But that year in general and beyond, we're going to cover a whole bunch of topics. But before we get to hockey, Boiler, how are you and how is your family doing? Well, we're all, we're all doing very well. We're great, um, especially all, all things considered. It's been uh, it's been interesting, but we're we're doing really well. We're here in, in Fort Lauderdale. We had to uh, go back up north for a little bit uh, for my son, but everything was everything was great. We came back when we were able to, and we're now we're uh, re quarantining. <laughs> it's it's been a challenge, but it's I'm sure everybody can relate to it. Well, let's get into this playoff year. And before we look at the series in 2016, Lightning Islanders, I think it's important to look back at the regular season that year. And if you go back to 14-15, that was pretty smooth sailing for the Lightning during the regular season. You guys did not lose three in a row at any point that year until the final three games of the Stanley Cup final. So you go into 15-16, and it's a much different start. Like the first half – is filled with potholes. You guys come into January. You're you're in jeopardy of missing the playoffs. You have a couple of hot streaks in the second half of the year to help you get into the playoffs. But what do you remember about the challenges of that season coming off the final run the year before? Well, it's so for for me and and, and Anton Strawman, we we both had. Uh, we had a run like that the year prior to the one we had in Tampa with, with New York and the change of scenery really helped kind of going down to Tampa. You have a new team, you have new, new teammates that you need to kind of earn their trust and, and new coaching staff. So you need to kind of earn their trust too. And it's, it's so much to be motivated by. And, you know, it's a short summer, but the statement and that part of the game, I think that's so it's, it's so difficult to manufacture. So when you have a group that came so close like we did in the year before in Tampa uh, in, in, in 14, 15, and the success that we had and how we kind of came together and, you know, even the first round of that, that playoff run the year before where we, you know, our backs were really up against the wall. It was crazy. Um, we came together and realized that we could, we could accomplish a lot and we knew how close we were, but, kind of the drop off in intensity, even, even in preseason games and, you know, when the season starts, you kind of just try to feel your way through it instead of going after teams. I mean, the year before Tampa lost, they got, they got swept by, I think Montreal before we got there. And, you know, there's a hunger there after that long of a layoff, it, it really feels like, you know, a first round loss is almost like, you know, you made the playoffs and that's a huge accomplishment, but it's tough. So we, we had to find a way to manufacture that. And we kind of had a, uh, I think we were in Calgary or Edmonton. I think it was Calgary. We had a, a players only meeting where we kind of watched. I think it was the whole game and, you know, Coop left the room and it was on us. Cause at that point he was just, he, you know, I thought he made a great decision saying, Hey, this is your team and you guys need to figure this out. So we had a really honest, uh, you know, at, at times difficult, conversation with one another like it's this far into the season and we don't have our identity there's something really wrong and if we don't find it you know they have no choice but to blow this thing up because if we don't make the playoffs or we don't have any kind of run here with how good we are you got to make changes and we didn't want that we were a very close group and and we expected more out of ourselves and 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 I think from that point on yeah, the season is a struggle, but the games get much, much harder, and we played much, much better. We got, we got, I think, really good, really fast. Yeah, that Western Canadian trip, uh, you guys had a rally in Edmonton, and that was the start of a seven-game winning streak, and then you had a nine-game winning streak later in that year. But even still, you didn't clinch a playoff spot until the final week of the regular season. You go into the playoffs, and you have to go in without Strawman, who broke his leg in late March, and without – Stammer, who gets the blood clot right before the end of the regular season, and what you guys were able to accomplish without both of those players for the bulk of the playoff year is remarkable. How do you think you were able to come together as a team to win two rounds and come within 
a game in the Stanley Cup final without those two critical pieces throughout that playoff year. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that goes, that speaks to our depth. Obviously we had, uh, you know, a number of guys that had uh, either, either they were coming up and like uh, Cooch and, and Johnny, I mean, the year before they had great playoff runs, but still they weren't, I don't think they were quite, you know, household names yet. And then everybody knows how good Victor is. I think our goaltending is really good. So we had a good balance. Like those other guys, I mean, Stammer's our leader, and the kind of way that whole thing went down too, I think it was we all kind of took it upon ourselves to make sure we went as far as we could so we could get our captain back because he's, you know, he's working out in the gym and his arm gets really swollen. And I remember it very clearly and, and just how upset he was. He had been through the the leg at that point and he worked hard to come back from that just kind of a freak thing and this was even more of a freak thing um you know so the guys would go in and visit him after his surgery and you know there was complications there obviously I don't want to get too much in depth with you know Stammer's overall health during that process but he was determined and we were determined as well to try and you know kind of pick up the slack I guess you could say Strauss is such a steady presence and uh, I, I, you know, I've gotten to play with him on, you know, three different teams now, but that was a kind of a freak thing too. He got twisted up in that, that leg and he, he's, you know, he's one of the toughest guys in terms of playing through pain that I've ever played with. And I don't know how many people know that, but when he was down and then he came, he came back to play, he was obviously in a lot of pain, but he was, he was going to do it no matter what, because those, those opportunities, you never know how many you're going to get. So we, we tried to take as much as we could from that put it on ourselves and different guys contributed as as they do if you can get through a few rounds in the playoffs you always need different guys contributing that was exciting because it it meant maybe a little bit more ice time for some guys you have to get excited about that and it showed our depth a little bit which was fun and for you personally you had five goals that playoff year including the one that we're going to talk about obviously in this Islander series now I'm re-watching some of the goals in that series and in some of the other series. And there you are in the power play in front of the net. And I was trying to remember, did you have that role in the regular season or was that due to the injuries that Coop put you there in the playoffs? It, it happened to be more, along, more or less towards the end of the year, each year for whatever reason. Um, and that might be because of maybe just simplifying and shot volume, but I always tried to be ready for that. It, it, it happened. It wasn't very often during the regular season. And I would joke that um, I was ready for the secret weapon to come out. No teams had scouted it. I'd be in front of it. <laughs> All I really did was stand there, but uh, it was exciting for me because it was, it was an important time of year and to have an opportunity on the power play is, is so much fun. It, it adds an element where you're kind of involved in a different way in the game. Uh, scoring goals is the most fun, but it was mostly towards the end of the year or, or in the playoffs at times. But we, I mean, we had so many good offensive guys. We could switch it up a little bit if it wasn't working. Different guys got to play on the power play throughout the year and in the playoffs. And I mean, we all trusted every one of them to get the job done because of the ability that we had offensively. So you enter the playoffs, you're playing Detroit in the first round, a rematch of that tough series the year before. The series only goes five games. The games are close. But to me, in speaking with Lightning fans, the lasting takeaway for a lot of fans from that series didn't have anything to do with a game that the Lightning won. It was you and Abdelkader in game three in Detroit and just a little backstory here at the end of game two a game the Lightning were about to win and go up 2 on the series Advocator gets involved in an altercation with Mike Blunden of the Lightning Advocator gets thrown out of the game there's some bad blood from the previous series the year before so in game three the one game Detroit wins you're ready to fight Advocator at the end of the game and he refuses so you make your chicken gesture. And I guess I'm just wondering, like, when that happened, did you have any idea that it would become this part of lightning lore <laughs> that's lasted years later? Uh, no. <laughs> Short answer. Uh, it was just, yeah, I, I uh, it, it was frustrating for us because obviously we, we had lost that game three. Yeah. 
um, going into the game, it's, it's in our memory, obviously, of how game two ended. Now we're in their building, and we, we had a teammate that we saw bloodied and, and kind of put in a vulnerable position. Um, so, you know, you want retribution in our game. It's, it's common. But you also, with the prospects of going up 3-0 and hopefully having a short series, you got to understand that there's a lot of different things at, at play at once. So it's tough because nobody wants to get thrown out or suspended. And that was kind of my mindset while we were kind of dancing around the ice for a while where I was asking him to go. Um, I believe he had a bandage on his hand or something where he wouldn't go. That was, uh, that's what I understood from his perspective, I guess, through the media. But I thought, I just thought that, I mean, if you do that to a guy, it's it, you have to answer the bell. And I, I really couldn't do anything else there without taking or putting myself in a position to maybe get suspended or start something else. So that's the only thing I could think of <laughs> to try to embarrass him a little bit because of, you know, really, right, just because of what he did to my teammate. Now, he's – we've had battles with him, I'll say that, over, over the years. He, he beat me in college, so there was a lot more uh, – <laughs> there a little anger maybe some jealousy for what he did to me when we were in college but um you know I think he was just trying to do what he had to do they had won the game already so he probably felt I don't want to speak for him but it was pretty frustrating for me that he wouldn't and that uh I felt like I had to do that for Blunden and I wasn't able to get a fight with him but um uh, I'm glad it kind of lived on because you know I love my time there and I like to have uh Hopefully it's a positive memory for some people because we did come back and end up winning the next two games. You do win the next two games. So you're on to the second round facing the Islanders who, and I'd forgotten this as I was researching the series, they actually had more regular season points than you guys, but the way the playoffs were structured, they ended up being the wild card. They beat Florida in the first round. Yeah. They come into Tampa and they, they win game one. You guys come back and win game two. So it's 1-1 going to Brooklyn for game three. And it's a wild game. It's back and forth. Kudrov scores the sixth attacker goal to tie the game in the final minute. It's 5-5. It goes into overtime. And on your goal, there's a lot to unpack. I rewatched it earlier today. And I'm like, man, there's so much happening here. So let's start at the end. <laughs> the goal. Hedman yeah. shoots the puck wide. It hits the backboards and comes ricocheting right in front. And you're there. But just because you're yeah. there doesn't mean that you're going to score. You have to stop that thing with your skate, settle it down, get it on your stick, and put it in the net. Because Grice is coming over. Like, he knows what's happening, but you have an instant before he's mm -hmm. there. How difficult was that play to make, understanding the puck's coming at you hard, you got to stop it with your skate and then settle it down and put it in. Yeah, that was a, uh, you know, you have some moments in your career where things, they say, I mean, you hear from athletes a little bit, things slow down a little bit. Well, this, things slowed down a little bit for me and then they sped up very quickly. <laughs> so the first thing was when, when, when Victor shot the puck, I was trying to pass to Callahan. He was kind of covered. I thought we had a, he had a little bit more time. And, you know, Victor, like he can, is up in the play. Um, he gets the puck and gets it off quick. So it's, it's chaos, but I kind of see it come off his stick and I realize it's going to go wide. So I stayed where I was and I just waited for the puck. I looked towards the boards. I waited for the puck to come. Now I saw it come. I tried to stop it with my skate, like you said. And at that point, you know, I can't score if I don't stop the puck first. And that's what I'm thinking. And if I did that, I said, all right, I just put it in the net. And then I kind of said, Oh shoot, here he comes. Now the puck was rolling and fortunate for me it was rolling. I was trying to go up, up on the short side, up high, because, you know, he was all the way on the other side of the net, Grice was, and it rolled on me a little bit. And I think it was under his arm and over his, either over his leg or over his uh, stick. It kind of didn't go exactly where I wanted it to go. And then it went in. And my reaction was like, Oh my God, it went in. I can't <laughs> believe it. An overtime goal in the playoffs. It's like what you dream of. Um, you know, it really was a cool thing. And then, um, you know, the, the moment when Callie jumped on me, I realized that this was, uh, you know, this was a special moment. 
you know, we were in a really tight, hard fought series. They were a physical team. Their fourth line was really physical. Um, I remember Condra got hurt that, I think it was game one. They came out flying and it's just a relief. I mean, you just, it's, it's such a cool feeling. I'll never forget it. I want to talk to you about the end, but I want to rewind a little bit because the play starts, you check Hickey just outside their blue line and he's out of the play. He falls down, he doesn't get up and you get the puck. It's, it's a kind of three on two at that point. And you mentioned Callie is in the middle. And I, until you said it, I was one. were you trying to, did you know it was a three on two and were you trying to get it to Callie, which you said you were, and did you know Hedman yeah. was coming late as the fourth guy? I didn't really realize Victor was in the play. I, uh, because, so I was a four, first four checker in the neutral zone. And I don't know if I was, I remember I had a little aggression in me. I might not have been playing quite as much that game for whatever reason. And I thought, you know, these overtime games are when the depth players really have to make a difference and try to do something to kind of get some momentum on our side. We're in their building. And I was a little more aggressive as the first four checker in the neutral zone. The, pack, the puck went D to D. And I remember Thomas Hickey makes the pass like kind of towards the middle. And I realized he didn't quite see me or expect me to hit him. Now, I hit him and he fell and he tried to sell it. And I was looking at him a little bit like, come on, don't try to sell it. And then I realized he turned it over. Um, so I kind of think I had to get back on side. That was kind of my thinking. I had to either straddle the blue line or make sure I stayed on side because I think they just had put in that offside challenge rule or whatever it was. But anyway, so I stayed on side and then I realized, okay, we got some time here because Hickey was still down. I couldn't believe it. I thought he was going to get up or uh, come after me quickly because you know, it wasn't really that egregious of a hit. Then I realized I saw Callie and I saw another guy drive and I just tried to get it over to the middle because I was kind of flat footed on my backhand and then I was going to try to join the play however I could. Uh, they had a back checker kind of get their stick on Cali. Wasn't a great pass either on my backhand, but it, you know, fortunately went right to Victor, who pounded it right away. So in the Lightning locker room, there still stands or hangs a picture of that goal that you score. And you know from having been in that room, significant <laughs> big plays adorn that wall. And your goal is up there. Have you ever scored an overtime goal? I know it was your first NHL overtime goal. Was that your first overtime goal in your career going back to college? Uh, I mean, I had an overtime goal in the American League, at okay. least one of those. And then in, co in college, I had, I had one that was pretty memorable. But um, that one takes the cake for sure. Just because, I mean, even I mean, looking back, even more so, just because of that series. And, I mean, they're just great memories, really. And, and you know, that's pretty cool to hear that I'm on that wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's still yeah. on that wall. That's nice. nice. So you guys end up winning game four in overtime. Again, Kucherov scores yeah, Garrison. The third to tie it. Garrison scores on a slap shot. And I just felt your best game in the series was game five. You just completely sucked yeah. the life out of them. And you scored in that game as well late first to make it two nothing did you have a sense going into the room after the first period with your goal that that was a gut punch it was going to be tough for them to come back it, it looked like they did not have as much push particularly after you guys jumped on them early yeah you know i think they, they had uh so we had those two overtime wins and those we, we know you know most guys know i mean if it goes the other way it's so tough really, because you put so much into just one game in the playoffs. And then if you don't win, you still need to, you still need to win four games. So even games you lose, you're, you're drained physically, mentally. But when you have, or you could start sniffing that finish line, like get through another series, there's another boost of energy. Like kind of like I talked about going the other way with early in that same year where we couldn't find that extra, that energy, that, uh, that excitement. You know, we, we got it there. And, and that's where you have it and you have to take advantage of it. Now, we, we jumped out to a lead. And I think kind of our mentality was the next period, really. It's like yeah. we have to keep going this way. We have to get the next one. We have to find a way 
to make sure they get no momentum, you know, things like staying out of the box, nothing after the whistle, stay out of it, stay out of it, take a punch, whatever it means. If you can advance, then there's only eight teams left really. So it's, I mean, there's uh, or then there's only four teams left rather. I mean, it's, it's so hard to win. It's hard to get to the playoffs and then even win a series. So we knew what was at stake. We were really excited about it. We took that energy and kept going. So then you see Pittsburgh in the semifinals, and that was a series that had a lot of everything. Bishop gets hurt in game one. They win overtime game two. You guys win overtime game five. You have a chance to close them out in game six. There's that coach's challenge on the offside where you guys thought you had scored and that goal gets taken away. They end up winning game seven by a goal. And for you, you've come so close in your NHL yeah. career. You've been to the, the Stanley Cup final twice. You've been to the conference final twice and lost. And not that you ever want to get good at <laughs> going through that, but like how do you absorb yeah. and kind of reflect and think back on these close calls? Do you ever get over them? Do you like play the what if game or do you just kind of learn to live with it and move on to the, the next game and the next year? Yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, that was I think that was sixty seven playoff games in three years. And twice you got to watch the other team celebrate the cup and then that third time that uh, obviously Pitt went on to win. Um that's how close. And great, great guys. I mean, if you know, you can cry in your Cheerios the day after or a couple of days after, but you know, I've found that even even after the fact, you know, teams like that that have had that kind of success, they don't come around very often. Now, people might not talk about them as much because they weren't cup champions, but we, I mean, we have fond memories of that. It's it's some of the best times. Those playoff rounds, you know, really all the playoff experiences I have, it's the best, most fun, most exciting hockey uh time really even even days off in between games it's the best it's the best thing that you know I've been able to do in terms of playing hockey really I mean and it's some of my fondest memories outside of like my family my kids my wife it, it really is it's something that I'll always cherish I'll always wish I mean imagine if we accomplished one where we got we got through when we got to the the top of the mountain how much how much greater that would feel. You know, you ask guys that you played with what it's like. It's, they have that commercial where they're interviewing the guys and they, they can't, they don't, they can't put it into words. I mean, I talked to guys like Brett Connolly at what's it like, he still doesn't really know how to explain it. So, you know, that's kind of what, that's a driving force. I'm still able to play. So that's kind of the, the uh, mentality I have. I'm thankful for that. I'm still able to play. Um, but geez, I mean, that's kind of what drives us. That's the motivation, really. But the what-if game, yeah, I know. It's, yeah. You go down that rabbit hole sometimes. <laughs> so the next year is a tough year for the Lightning. Uh, they would end up missing the playoffs by a point. You get moved at the deadline to Toronto. Yeah. That offseason you sign with the Devils. You're getting ready for your first year with the Devils. You go in for all the testing prior to the season, and they call you with – a test that is that is suspicious, I guess, where, and it turns out that you have cancer. Do you have any symptoms at all heading into the preseason testing that might have given you cause for alarm, or were you just completely kind of struck by lightning, no pun intended, uh, when you got that call? Yeah, no, it was, uh, there were symptoms that things started to make a lot more sense once I got the information. Um, so going back to that trade, it, it, it kind of floored me really. And I, I tried to prepare myself for it as best I could, but getting moved was like, it was really hard. It was really, really, really hard for me. And I think the first time you get traded, it's, it's especially mid season, um, you know, saying bye to my wife and my, you know, my little boy was still sleeping. I had to leave early in the morning. All that stuff was, it was an immense amount of stress that I hadn't gone through yet in my life ever to that point. And it was tough for me to kind of wrap my head around it. And then, you know, kind of getting comfortable in, in Toronto, but then having to 
go through free agency again. There was a lot of stresses that were going on in my life. So I just assumed that, you know, we just welcomed our daughter. Um, there was just too much going on. So I was, I was pretty fatigued and excuse me, as the, uh, as the summer kind of went on, I was feeling pretty good. I was in pretty good shape. And for whatever reason, like week to week, I just started declining. My energy was going down. I was, I was, uh, I remember playing golf one time on the weekend before the season started, like right about when I was supposed to leave or maybe a couple of weeks before. And I was on like the seventh hole and I just kind of wanted to go home and take a nap, which has never happened to me before in, in any kind of competitive competitive environment yeah. especially not golf which I love to do but I would take naps for three hours during the day I'd go to bed at 10 I'd wake up at 8 I'd feel okay in the morning and go do my workout I would feel a little bit worse each day in the workout and by the time I got to, to, to the training camp before the tests and stuff where I was meeting the guys I skated for about 20 minutes and I I couldn't uh, I couldn't recover on the bench I couldn't catch my breath I couldn't catch a pass and I was really nervous that something was really wrong or that I just couldn't play anymore and didn't know what it was. We did the blood work and then Kevin Morley, the trainer in, in uh, New Jersey was like, we have to go to the hospital and get more blood work. Turned out I had you know, 85,000 or 87,000 white blood cells going through my blood and they were very alarmed. And I was really scared because now I realized what was making me feel so terrible stuff. I just tried to brush off whether I was dehydrated or something or had some new allergy that I didn't know about. It was, it was going to be a little bit worse than what I originally thought. So it's still a shock. It's still, like you said, like a, a lightning strike to your whole soul. When they tell you that 32 years old, I got a you know four or five month old daughter, a two year old son. Um, but the more information we got, the more positive the uh, prognosis looked. And they found a way to treat it. They were able to, to come back and play and are still playing. And of course, that year, the All-Star game, the All-Star weekend, uh, would be taking place in Tampa. And Taylor Hall got hurt. If I'm remembering this right, Taylor Hall was the mm -hmm. devil's rep. Yep. He got hurt. And you got an opportunity to go, uh, to go to the All-Star game, to do it in Tampa, and to be recognized the way you were by Lightning fans. Like, what does that mean to What did it mean to you then, and what does it mean to you now? That was crazy. Uh, that was a crazy time. Because you know, Halsey did get hurt. He had an unbelievable year. Obviously, he won the Hart Trophy that year. Yeah. Um, you know, he was – I felt so bad because – he should have been recognized and what he was doing. He did. He got recognized at the end of the year with, with the hard trophy. But, you know, I talked to him about it. I talked to uh, my wife about it. The, the, the kind of wrinkle in the whole thing, which it was tough. I almost, uh, I almost couldn't go because my son had a pretty big operation that, that week. And I was, I, uh, I wasn't going to go. I said, this was, this was such a cool thing. And, I had this weird feeling that I'd be down there for some reason. And, and they asked me to go. I couldn't believe it. And I called my dad, obviously. And he said, you have to go. I said, I can't go. I can't go. And my wife made me go. She said, you're going. And um, so Declan was in uh, the ICU for a little bit. The doctor actually who was working on him was like, he'll be totally fine. And you should do this. And so I got to go down and, it was tough leaving for sure. I went, I got there a day late because I was actually in Boston with him during the break. But my dad came down with me, and it's kind of perfect because you know he loved he loved it down there in, in Tampa too. He came down a lot. He got close with some of the medical guys there, and they did two dad's trips there. He was, you know, he loved it down there. I did too. And chance for us to go back. My little brother came over. He was at Eckerd College at the time, and. So those two were there. We took zero pictures because there wasn't anybody smart enough to take a phone out <laughs> and take a picture. Um, but it was so cool. And then, and then that first announcement, I was floored. Like I could not believe it because I, I know how much Tampa meant to me and my family and how wonderful those years were down there. But I, I didn't, uh, I didn't expect it to be reciprocated quite as much. And I mean, it, it still means the world to me um just the, the, the outpouring of love and 
know, I noticed it when I was sick and when I came out with uh, the news that I was sick, all the support that I got, you know, so much of it from Tampa, you know, and, and all the places that I played and, and even places I hadn't played. But uh, there was a special kind of bond that I had with that, that city and I loved it. Um, it was nice to feel love back, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, it was, it was totally an experience I'll never, ever forget. Well, I know that Lightning fans always appreciated not only how you played, but the attitude that you brought onto the ice with every shift, not to mention everything that you did in the community. And I mean, that goes a long way anywhere, certainly, but uh, they appreciated Brian Boyle, the player, appreciate Brian Boyle, the player, and Brian Boyle, the man, too. And I think that's why you had such a lasting impact here. But Boiler, my clock is running close to 40, so I need to, I need to say goodbye. But thank you so much okay. for taking the time to reminisce. And I'm glad to see that you're doing well, your family's well, and hopefully we'll all be back at this before too long. Yeah, I hope so. Th thanks for having me, Dave. I hope same, all the best to you and your family, too.